Well, good evening. Sorry, in university ministry, we like to start at 20 minutes after, so uh, this is us getting a, an early start on the evening. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley as the Minister for University Engagement. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's inaugural Berkeley Palmer Lecture. Named in honor of the Reverend Earl Palmer, who was, of course, pastor, senior pastor here at First Pres Berkeley from 1970 to 1991 and founding trustee of New College Berkeley, Earl has modeled a commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ that engages both the church as well as the university communities. And so these annual lectures will examine timely issues of concern to the university, to the seminary, and of course, to the church, all through the lens of biblical scholarship. We are very glad that you all are here tonight joining us for the first in what we hope will be a long-standing tradition of engaging annual lectures at the intersection of the church and the academy. And so now I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. Susan Phillips, Executive Director of New College Berkeley, who will be introducing for us tonight's guest speaker. Thank you, Ryan. That was Ryan Pemberton, the uh, Minister of University and College Ministry here at First Press Berkeley. And he and Mark Stryker and Tom Elson on the staff here at the church and some of us from New College and Marianne White and Barry Coops and other people have been working for about a year in crafting this lectureship and are so delighted that Dr. Craig Barnes has accepted the invitation to be the inaugural lecturer here. Not only does Dr. Barnes have a long association with the Reverend Palmer through the work of Princeton Theological Seminary and that seminary's board, but they're both pastors who have shaped the American church through preaching, teaching, and writing. Earl, earlier this evening, said that uh, Dr. Barnes is actually his favorite Ameri North American theologian to read. And a friend of mine said that to me this afternoon, too. Craig Barnes, like Earl Palmer, studied at Princeton Theological Seminary. And Dr. Barnes went on to get a PhD in the history of Christianity at the University of Chicago. He has served as the pastor of three congregations, including National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., where Earl also served during a season in the church's uh, life. In the fall of 2002, Dr. Barnes became the Manili Professor of Pastoral Ministry at Pittsburgh Seminary, while also serving as the senior pastor of Shadyside Presbyterian Church. And then in 2012, he was elected president of Princeton Theological Seminary, where he still serves. Dr. Barnes has written eight books, including Searching for Home, The Pastor as Minor Poet, and Body and Soul. And he's an editor at large and frequent contributor to the Christian century. His writing illuminates scripture so that we may better walk the path of faith by its light. In, in, I direct New College Berkeley, but I also serve as a spiritual director, and I often in that work hear people referencing two of Dr. Barnes's book, actually the first two of his books, um, as books that help them get through difficult seasons in their lives. And they are Yearning and When God Interrupts. But let me tell you the subtitles. Yearning's subtitle is Living Between How It Is and How It Ought to Be. 
And the subtitle of When God Interrupts is Finding New Life Through Unwanted Change. So he is a theological scholar, but a very pastoral uh, scholar in his writing and his teaching. And I keep these books on my shelves to lend out to people. In these annual lectures, we hope to bring biblical scholarship in a way that it informs the university, the church, and the seminary, and those of us in those places as we seek to follow Jesus Christ, as we look for hope in a world that sometimes feels off kilter. So it is my great privilege to welcome Dr. Craig Barnes. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's a uh, extraordinary honor uh, to be asked to be here to launch at the inauguration of the Berkeley Palmer Lecture Series, which has been designed in part to um, honor um, the work, the life work of one of the country, if not the world's greatest Bible expositor. Earl Palmer, which makes us all wonder why is he sitting there and I'm sitting, standing up here, wouldn't we all rather have Earl standing up here? I know I would, but it is, uh, I do appreciate this great honor to, um, to be a part of uh, this, the uh, launching of the lecture series and to uh, stand at a pulpit in this spectacular church. Um, his ministry has always been a source of inspiration to us all over the country. So bless you and well doing. And please know that uh, your future is filled with hope, filled with hope. Let me pray for us. Holy God, we've all gathered here in hopes of hearing something that could only be your word. No mere mortal words will do. So tonight, be gracious to our seeking, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to look uh, with you uh, at the great uh, temptations of Christ, which I think are the great temptations of all humanity. Temptation always presents itself as an opportunity, an enticement to be something more than human. But the devil's a liar. And to succumb to these temptations is actually to become less than human. Thus the title of this series, The Temptation to be Less Than Human. And uh, I know better than to uh, present a lecture with the word Palmer in it. Uh, to try to do that without working from a text. So um, I, I do have a biblical text, and I'll be in the third chapter of Matthew to get started. We can't really make sense of the temptations of Christ as Matthew has depicted them without attending to the baptism of Jesus. So let me start with that, and I'll um, just start at verse 13 of Matthew chapter 3. And Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, Suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist has always been something of an enigmatic figure to me. I can't figure out what to make of him. He's a bit of an extreme figure. He's supposed to be. 
He spent much of his time out in the wilderness. He had odd clothes. He had a strange diet. Um, but the hardest part about him is that he strikes us as a turn or burn kind of preacher. When you read in the first part of chapter 3, he shows up saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then he talks about what's going to happen when the Messiah comes. And he's going to have a, a winnowing fork and, it, uh, and there's fire coming down from the heavens. I mean, it doesn't sound good. I don't even know what winnowing forks are, but I, I know it's not good. And I do know what fire is, and I know that's not good. And this is what I mean by turn or burn. Repent, get ready. The Messiah is coming. Judgment is on the way. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Severe warnings of judgment and doom. So isn't it fascinating that we're told all of Judea came out to hear John preach? Really? Such judgmental preaching? All of Judea wanted to hear him. And they would come out and they would submit to his baptism, which was kind of like our prayer confession. It was a ritual washing away of sin. Then they would go back to Jerusalem or throughout Judea. They would sin again and they would come back for more judgmental preaching and another washing in the Jordan. Trying futilely to get their lives cleaned up before the Messiah comes. All of Judea. When I was in graduate school, some of our professors were bothered by the fact that judgmental preaching is still very popular. And they were convinced that in this post-enlightenment day, we should have outgrown this stuff by now. So they do what professors will often do when they are confused. They set up a panel discussion. <laughs> and I went to it. And there was a psychologist on this panel. And her contribution to the discussion is that people like to go to hear judgmental preaching and warnings of judgment that's coming because they're convinced that the preacher is talking about somebody else. Somebody that they don't like. Somebody they hope gets judged. There was a Marxist uh, historian on the panel, which is kind of an unfortunate thing to be these days. Uh, but his point was that these are the dispossessed, the what we used to call the proletariat, who are showing up in the pews of these churches, and the economic system is not working for them, and so they just as soon have God go ahead and blow a little fire down on the whole mess, because they've got nothing to lose. And then there was uh, a theologian who said something about being in post-enlightenment era. And this is, um, he just repeated how confused he was. Now, I sat there and took notes on all of this because I, I was a student. This could be on a test sometime or something. But I had been a pastor for a while before going back to work on my PhD, and I had a theory of my own for why judgmental preaching is popular. Uh, in fact, even, even during the times that I was preaching before, I went to the, back to the divinity school, some of the people would want to know why I didn't do more judgmental preaching. They wanted what I would call the bad dog sermon. Uh, and I could never figure this out early in my ministry. Why do people like the bad dog sermon? where I would stand at the pulpit and stick my finger out and essentially scold them like bad dogs. You bad, bad dogs. Look what you did, bad dog. Take that outside. We don't do that in here. And they would sit out there like, like scolded golden retrievers and they would say, you're right, I did it again. I did it again. So why do we like this? Because it's what we know. Judgment's what we've always known. From when we were first born, we've known judgment. A number of years ago, I went to see a woman who had just given birth. She was still in the hospital. It was the first day she was holding this baby. I got to the, the room. Uh, she was crying. I thought they were like tears of joy or something like that. No, she was upset. 
and she was upset because there, her baby had just been evaluated by the APGAR test, and he got like an eight. <laughs> she said, he's one day old, he's already got his first B minus. <laughs> and so it continues after the very first day. We continue to be judged by our parents when we were children. <laughs> we get judged by our children when we become parents. <laughs> we get judged by um, our coaches, our teachers, our employers, and most severely of all by the person who just keeps showing up in the mirror. And the judgment is always not good enough. So we join all Judea in going to hear John preach, and we say, Amen. You preach it, John. Well, then the Messiah shows up. And John essentially says, this is the guy I've been warning you about. <clears throat> but Jesus doesn't bring uh, a winnowing fork or fire. Instead, he surprises John by saying he's there for baptism. And they argue about this a bit. John's point is essentially, you're the standard we're trying to meet. You're the judge we've been trying to get washed up for and cleaned up for and get our lives in good shape for. I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. They argue about this for a while. Jesus wins the argument, as is his nature, and this is what's so spectacular. This one who is without sin and this baptism for the remission of sin identifies with the human predicament and the futility of getting our lives cleaned up. He identifies with those of us who deserve judgment and know it. And we are our worst judges, by the way. He identifies with this essential human condition this is a further pressing of the incarnation of God as human. And we know that in part because upon his baptism, the spirit of God, the text says, descends on him. This spirit is always the spirit as the agent of the incarnation. Remember when the angel announces to Mary that she's going to give birth to Jesus, what does he say? The spirit will come upon you and you will give birth. Um, and now we have the spirit descending upon him in this other act of his identification with humanity. And then the voice from heaven, this is my beloved with whom I am so pleased. This is what's significant. Jesus does not receive the identification of being the beloved of God until his baptism. It doesn't happen at his birth. It doesn't happen until his baptism. When he identifies with the human condition in an identification that is so total and so complete that this is what heaven is saying about you, about us. You are the beloved of God with whom he is pleased. Why is he pleased? Not because you finally got your life cleaned up. Not because you finally started to make good choices. Not because you've done so well in life. He's pleased simply because you belong to God and in Jesus Christ you have been found. That's what pleases God. You have been found as the beloved. That's key to understanding these great temptations. As soon as this baptism event has occurred, the next thing that happens, chapter 4, verse 1, immediately after the baptism. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice, by the Spirit, he's led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it's written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So 
the Spirit is pressing the incarnation still deeper yet. Even after the baptism, now the Spirit leads him into these fundamental great temptations all humanity face. And the first one is to turn stone into bread. I've often wondered, what's the big deal about this temptation? Why is this one of the top three of our human temptations, turning a stone into bread? He's been there 40 days. We know he's famished. We know that he feeds hungry people at other times. We know that he enjoys dinner parties. He goes to them. It's one of the things he gets in trouble with is who he has dinner with. Uh, so clearly, there's nothing inherently wrong with eating or with food. I don't think the temptation was about eating. I think that this is a temptation not to be hungry. That's the temptation. Not to be hungry. We are created hungry. We face appetite the first thing every morning. It returns to us again. And we hunger not just for food. We hunger for intimacy. We hunger for significance. We hunger for fulfillment. We hunger for purpose. Those of us who are paying attention to the world around us hunger for justice. And we are never full for long. I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Appetite creates choice. And the choice is you can either be enslaved by that appetite and make it your God and spend the rest of your life trying to satisfy appetite, or you can choose the faithfulness of a God whose ways you do not understand. Every one of Jesus' miracles where he fed people were not meant to take care of their hunger because the next day, Everybody Jesus fed was hungry again. His healings were not meant to prevent people from ever being sick because they all got sick and died. Um, so he, obviously he's about something other than taking away hunger or, or disease. He's about revealing the presence of God in their midst. So Jesus responds to this temptation to not be hungry by saying, we it's been written, we live not by bread, but by the word of God. Well, what was the word of God that was just spoken? You are the beloved with whom God is pleased. What does it mean to live by that? See, I think every one of these temptations is causing us to doubt that word from heaven <clears throat> about our lives that you are beloved, which means she is beloved and he is beloved by God. Is that sufficient? Or do we need to turn to our satisfaction of our hunger? As long as you have the hunger, as long as you are a steward of the, the appetite, you have freedom. You are free to choose rather than being one who is enslaved by your yearning. Those who are enslaved by yearning are the less free people I know. As long as you can make choices, you still then have the freedom to decide how you will live your life, to what you will commit your, your time, your talents, your money, your energies, your vision. You have the freedom to do that. You lose that freedom if you make appetite your God if you don't know how to be hungry. Free people are always hungry. One of the best scenes ever in literature of this is Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor and the Brothers Karamazov. In the novel, Jesus returns to earth to visit the city of Seville in the 16th century at the height of the Great Inquisition. The Grand Inquisitor, a cardinal in the church who was an old man with a withered face and sunken eyes, recognizes Jesus and throws him into prison for interrogation. The Inquisitor is furious with Jesus for his response to these three temptations. He's furious that Jesus refused to dazzle humanity with the power to satisfy appetite. This is what he says to Jesus. 
You came into the world empty-handed with nothing but some vague promises of freedom, which men cannot even conceive and which they fear and dread. For there's never been anything more difficult for man and human society to bear than freedom. In the end, they will always lay their freedom at our feet and say to us, enslave us, but feed us. That's how totalitarian sources of power um, get into power, uh, by the offer to feed, but at the cost of being enslaved. And to be human, to be fully human, is to be free. But again, my thesis is that we may, we're going to have Q&A at the end of this. Someone may want to press me on this. You can't be free. You cannot be free without being hungry. And the trust that God will take care of the hunger that you have in the day that you need it. Remember when the, the, Moses was leading the Hebrews uh, through the, uh, the Red Sea and through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. And God says to Moses, he has to take the people by the hard road, the long way through the desert, lest when they run into difficulty in the promised land, they will turn back to slavery. So God is concerned that the Hebrews keep their freedom. And the way that he shows them how to keep their freedom is to show them what to do with their hunger along the way in the desert. And they don't make it far into the desert and the people start complaining about the fact that they're hungry. And so God provides the manna. You've all heard sermons and devotionals on the manna. We know how wonderfully it works as a metaphor for the spiritual life. Uh, it's, everybody has to get their own. There's no group plan. You've got to take care of your own spiritual disciplines. Uh, it's not a lot. No one uh, had weight uh, issues on this journey. Uh, it, was, it was just enough for the day. You couldn't store it up. You had to get it every day all wonderful um, metaphors for the spiritual life. My favorite one, though, is the name itself, manna, which is Hebrew for what is it? I just love this part of the story. Every morning, I assume it was probably the moms would go out and get a bill, a bowl of what is it? And they would bring it back home and I'm sure they would try to prepare it as creatively as they could, but there was no what is it helper. <laughs> and they would put it on the table and their teenagers would say, what is it? <laughs> and the mother would say, yes. <laughs> day after day after day on the journey, they are nourished and nurtured by mystery by questions. What is it, God, that you're asking of us? What is it, God, that's so special about the promised land? What is it, God, that you are doing in my life, in our life? What are you molding in us? What, 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 what? Um, all the way up to the Gospel of John, where Jesus identifies himself as the manna. So now the question is, what is it that Jesus is doing in our life? That's the question for hungry people. What is it that Jesus is doing? and you keep your freedom. This is exactly what the Grand Inquisitor was worried about. You keep your freedom by keeping your hunger. One more just kind of detour on this theme of being hungry. It is striking to me that in the creation narratives, which give us just the only tiniest a glimpse we had of what God had in mind, it's just a couple of pages. Here, look at my Bible. It's... it's this right here. This is what we know of what God had in mind. Then we mess that up, and the whole rest of the book is basically a recovery plan. <laughs> so these opening couple of chapters are very important to us. And in the opening glimpse of what we know of what God had in mind for us, we were placed in a garden, told that we could freely eat of all of the fruit of all of the trees except one right? Which meant that all of it was given. So to eat of any of this fruit was inherently, uh, as Alexander Schmiemann says, it was doxological eating, because we know it was given food. 
So it was a way of saying thanks to God for all that we have. It's why to this day we still uh, bow our heads and pray before our meals. It's a way of uh, acknowledging dependency upon God as the provider of, of our food, of the, the one who keeps us from starving to death. But there was one tree that they could not eat of, right? There was forbidden fruit. Do you remember where that was located? In the middle of the garden, right here in every life, right in the midst of it, which means that as the narrative goes, Adam and Eve had to pass this thing every day, this reminder that they did not have all the garden, that it wasn't all theirs for the taking. And according to Eve, this fruit was to be desired. It was something they really wanted. And that's what Adam desired it. Something they desired, something for which they yearned, they did not have. It was not given. And to eat of it was sinful because it was not doxological. They were not eating something that was given. They were taking something they were not allowed to have. And this is God's idea of a good garden, by the way. This is not the result of the fall. This is what God had in mind from the beginning. This is our created nature. This is what it means according to Genesis, to be human. It means to have a whole in you. Now, your whole may be different than mine, but we all have something for which we've yearned that we are never going to have. And the question is, what do you do about that hole in your life? What do you do about that part of the garden that you do not have? And you're not going to have it. That can either drive you crazy to the point where you insist on taking it, and that's when you lose the garden as the story goes. And then you realize on the way out, it was a pretty good garden, even though something was missing in it. But by then, it's paradise lost. Or you can turn that thing which is missing, that source of hunger in your life, into an altar where you pray your dependency upon the one who calls you the beloved. One of the reasons why the church has a hard time motivating itself to acts of social justice and compassion in the world is precisely because we're preoccupied with our own hunger. We can't see what authentic, massive hunger looks like because we've all got something right here that absorbs all of our energy and we can't figure out why God doesn't give us this. We can't even lift up to look around us to see the trouble that we are in as a people. Let's get back to the text. Uh, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him to the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Notice how the temptation starts. If you are the son of God, cast yourself down. It's as if to say, if you are so beloved by God, cast yourself down. If, so he's, again, we're creating doubt about the word of God spoken at baptism. Are you truly the beloved? And it's interesting that the devil knows scripture. So he's quoting here from Psalm 91. If you jump down, the angels will be sent to protect you so you cannot dash your foot against a stone. They're at the top of the temple looking down into the Kindred Valley. That's a 450-foot drop. Uh, when I envision this scene, I kind of think of Jesus and the devil as junior high school boys. Um, as I've raised these, I know what they're like. Go ahead, jump. You are the beloved, right? Wouldn't you like to be sure of that? We would all like to be sure of that. Go to jump. What, you afraid? Come on, I, I dare you. I double dog dare you to jump. That's what, that's what this test is about. The second temptation is a temptation to certainty. The first one was a temptation to not be hungry. This one is a temptation to be certain. 
And the reason this is a temptation is because nothing is more dangerous to your spiritual life than certainty. But that's a hard statement for most of us to swallow because we would love to have a little certainty, a little more than we have. Um, you know, Doubting Thomas wanted to be certain. He wanted to put his, his, his hand in the wounds. But have you ever noticed that in, in the Gospels, Thomas is always introduced as Thomas the twin? Well, we don't know jack about Thomas's twin. He could be anybody. He could probably be you, right? Couldn't you be, I bet you could be Thomas's identical twin. Because as Jesus may say, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And that sounds like Jesus, but we, we'd like to see. We would love to see. And if you think about it, when you read the, all of the stories about the miracles in the Bible, in the Old and in the New Testament, don't you ever get a little jealous for these folks who live in a world and at a time where miracles were abound? Haven't you ever thought to yourself, I don't think I've ever really seen a bona fide miracle. I mean, not just a nice turn of events, but a real bona fide miracle. Like you wake up in the morning and there are letters on your bedroom wall. Go to Princeton Seminary. <laughs> Marry the short guy. Just something real clear, real obvious. The problem with that is that if you saw that, it would take away your capacity for faith. And it is faith that binds us to God, not certainty. Humans were created to be a people of faith. And faith is actually nurtured by doubts. I have doubts and our faith make good next door neighbors. They talk to each other all the time. They have a good relationship. Jesus is actually very forgiving of people's doubts when you read through the gospels. Um, it's remarkable how, uh, how uh, forgiving he is of people's doubts. Remember when he is talking to the father of the boy who has the demon and he's flopping around on the ground and Jesus says, all things are possible for those who believe and the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. Kind of like I have faith, but it's riddled with doubts. That's good enough for Jesus. He heals the boy right on the spot. And in John 6, uh, when people are starting to leave Jesus uh, because he's been saying things that aren't very popular, Jesus then looks at the disciples and says, what about you all? Are you going to leave too? Do you remember their response? They said, where would we go? Which is not exactly saying the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> I can see them looking at each other and going, nah, we got nothing else going. Um, where would we go? No, we're sticking around, I guess. But that's good enough for Jesus. He, he continues to stay with them, um, even with that statement. And... Uh, also in Matthew, at the end of the gospel, after the resurrection, after the resurrection, the gospel ends with Jesus along with the disciples, and it said that some of them doubted. Now, I would think if you're looking at the risen Jesus, like fresh from the tomb, that pretty much take care of the doubt thing. But it doesn't, because we don't actually believe what we see. Uh, we see what we've chosen to believe. Um, but there's no scolding of them for their doubts, even at that point, because the text says, but they worshipped. They doubted, but they worshipped. And that's always been good enough for Jesus. Ironically, what Jesus is hard on is not our doubts, but our fear. While he is uh, accommodating to people's doubts, he is relentlessly hard on people who are afraid. Remember the parable about the servant who was only given one talent and he was afraid of losing it? So he buried it because he was afraid? The judgment that that guy gets is one of those cast him into outer darkness, gnashing of teeth kind of judgments. Very severe judgment. And Jesus was very hard on those who were afraid to leave what they were clinging to in order to follow. And when Jesus was with the disciples and they were in, in, in uh, at sea and they were in a storm 
uh, they were uh, afraid, and Jesus would, uh, uh, there were several of these stories, but sometimes he's asleep in the boat, don't you, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus wakes up, he calms the storm, and then he scolds them for their lack of faith. And when Peter is, sees Jesus and he is walking towards Jesus on the water, and he realizes he can't actually walk on water, and so he starts to sink, Jesus pulls him out of the water, and right there on the waves, he starts scolding him. Oh, you of such little faith. I've always wondered, why doesn't Jesus scold the guys in the boat? Like, at least Peter gave this a try. <laughs> but, but Jesus is hard on those uh, who have a little faith, harder than he is on those who have no faith, because he expects us to have learned something by walking by faith. So it appears to Jesus that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear, because fear is what diminishes our humanity much more than our doubts. And we get more clarity about the problem with fear when we get to 1 John, and we're told that perfect love does what? Cast out fear. That's the only way I know that we get rid of fear. As a pastor, for many years, I have tried to argue people out of their fears, and I have never succeeded in doing it. Because fear is not a matter of rationality. Um, so arguments aren't really that helpful when people are afraid. I can't even argue myself out of my own fears. When it's like 2 in the morning, and I'm anxious about something, and I'm looking at the clock on the nightstand, which has become my grand inquisitor right now, 201, 202, and I keep thinking about this thing that I'm anxious about. Every time I try to come up with a rational reason for why it probably won't happen, I can invent two more for why it could. So the only thing that helps is for me to get up and read the Psalms. I've got to get loved out of my fear. Anyone who's ever raised a child who has, who has a little child struggled with monsters and their nightmares, you understand this. When your kid starts screaming in the middle of the night, what loving parent would go to the door and say, now, now, we've talked about this. There's no such thing as monsters. That's ridiculous. You're being absurd. No, you don't do that. You'd lose your parent card for doing that. <laughs> you, you rush into the bedroom. You pick the kid up. You love the kid to the point where the child is no longer thinking about monsters. They're thinking about being in your arms. We are only loved out of our fears. And um, this, is, this is why um, this, this perfect love is the, is the measure of faith that we are able to develop um, by the love that we receive, being, again, the beloved. You are, you are the beloved with whom God is so pleased. That's how you get rid of the fear. Um, and you've got to do that if you're going to live by faith, and you're only going to be united to God by faith. Have you ever been in a human relationship where there was not faith, where you had to keep proving that you loved somebody, whether it's a friend or in a romantic relationship? You'll never succeed in proving that you love somebody. Relationships that are based on the ability to prove your love are doomed they, because the relationship cannot survive on that. There has to be a choice, a belief. As St. Augustine demonstrates in his confessions, at the end of the day, faith is not a matter of emotions or feelings, nor is it a matter of the intellect or what you know. He tried to get to faith both through his feelings and his intellect, and neither of them would get him there. In the end, faith is an act of the will, a choice. That's how all healthy relationships are built on choice. We choose to believe. It's not about certainty. It's about a choosing to believe, not putting, as Jesus says to the devil, not putting God to the test. Prove to me that you love me. This is what jumping from the pinnacle would have done. That's always deadly to a relationship. It's not about certainty. It is about a will, a choice. And that's why it's always a grace to be able to, give, to be given this. You know, I think the greatest temptations that we face along the way in life are not from, not from evil things, but from good things. Being certain sounds like such a good thing, um, but it is not when it comes to your relationship with God, or any relationship for that matter. Uh, you would love to think that God would never get, make you hurt, but to be human is to hurt. 
At some point, we all hurt, right up to the point where we hurt our way right into the grave. That is part of the human condition. Uh, that makes you fully human to hurt, actually. It's not a very sentimental notion, but it is a, it is a description of full humanity. For one of the, it's part of the created package to hurt. Um, but fear, fear is to make you less than human. And what the devil is actually tempting us here, when he, this call to be certain, he's tempting us to focus on our fears, um, which is inevitably to be much less than human. Let's turn quickly to the third. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus and the devil are at the top of a mountain and the devil looks out over all these things and has Jesus look out at all the kingdoms of the world. He says, I'll give you all of this if you just worship me. And Jesus says, away with you. Notice what Jesus does not say. Jesus does not say, ha, what do I care about the kingdoms of the world? Jesus would love to have the kingdoms of the world that's what the incarnation was all about, coming to reclaim the kingdoms of the world. So this is not a temptation about ends. It's about a temptation to give Jesus what he wants. The temptation is to make a deal with the devil to get what good things you want. It's a temptation about means. So the devil doesn't try to tempt Jesus out of being the Messiah. I think that's so important. He doesn't say, you know, this Messiah business, you know, it's going to end in the cross. I know, let's avoid that if we can. I've got this nice little place in Capri. It's good golfing. You can have it. Because he knows that's not going to be tempting to Jesus. Similarly, think about how the devil tempts you. You're the kind of person who shows up in church on a Saturday night for Pete's sakes. So do you think the devil's going to show up in your life and say, Eh, church smirch. Uh, let's run numbers for the mob. That's, that's where the big money is. That's what you should be doing. No, because that's not going to be tempting to you. No, real temptation, fundamental temptation that gets to us is when the devil says, you've got great goals. You want to have wonderful children, don't you? Don't you want to have wonderful kids? You want to be very successful in the work that you think God's given you to do in the marketplaces or in the academy. Don't you want to be successful in the academy or in the marketplace? Well, yeah, of course. I can help you. I understand the world. I know how it is. It's just going to take a little complicity with the way it is because I understand the world. You've got to be a realist. Anytime you hear a voice telling yourself, you've got to be a realist, you want to wonder if this is really the Holy Spirit that's talking. Because normally what that means is you've got to lower the goals that you've inherited as, as one created by God. Jesus was able to resist the devil's temptation by two ways, I think. One, he knows the devil is lying because the devil doesn't actually have the kingdoms of the world to give. They don't really belong to the devil. The devil's always a liar. But more to the point, uh, Jesus was never committed to the world he saw, which is the world that the devil claims to own. He's committed to the world that he envisions. That's how you avoid making a deal with the devil, is remind, re remaining committed to the world that you envision, the world that God envisions, the world that Jesus described, the world that the rest of the book depicts. When Jesus talked to the Pharisees about his identification as the Messiah, they laughed at him. How unrealistic for someone from Nazareth to be the Messiah. They scoffed. It was so unrealistic for Jesus to be the Messiah. 
when Paul tried to take the Gospels to the Gentiles, the Jewish Christian believers tried to resist this. That's not, that's not our message. It doesn't belong to them. That's completely unrealistic to go there. When in the 5th century, the, the barbaric tribes were about to sack Rome and there were no Roman officers or armies left in Rome to defend the city, Pope Leo said he was going to go out to the gates of Rome to try to talk the barbarians out of it. That's exactly what he did. They laughed at Leo on his way to the gates to say, we'd rather you not sack Rome, please. And it worked. They laughed at Martin Luther's Reformation efforts. They laughed at Martin Luther King Jr.'s Reformation efforts. They scoffed at Mother Teresa. They scoffed at Nelson Mandela. All of their dreams were thought to be highly unrealistic, but they were absolutely committed to a vision of life on this world that they had inherited called the kingdom of Christ. And how did they get that vision? They knew the scriptures. How did Jesus resist all three of these temptations? He quoted scripture. That's how he knew it. How do we resist temptation? We go to biblically centered worship and we get ourselves caught up in this worship experience where we are renewed in the great holy drama that God is still unfolding. We live in a society that all week long has taught us to be saturated with ourselves, thinking that we self-construct our own identity, thinking that we create our own lives, choosing to... Uh, tempt us to ignore the fact that life is an inheritance from the God who calls us the beloved and who is pleased because we've been found again. Telling that we're on our own, it's up to us and our heart effort to pull life together the best way we can. And the way we think we self-construct this life is through choices, whether it's as kids, as adults, it's all about making choices. Try to make, if you don't like the life you have now, choose again and choose again and choose again. Thinking that through these choices, you can, you can pull together a good life but that leaves us constantly frustrated, constantly realizing that the last thing that we chose didn't satisfy our hunger either. Right, it's never going to, whether it's a relationship or another move or another job. And so we're constantly preoccupied with self and constantly disappointed in our choices. We drive home from work at the end of a long day and we're exhausted. And we, What do we say in the car on the way home? I don't think they appreciate me there. I'm working so hard, no one really appreciates me down there. And then you get home and you walk into your house and your family does not stand and sing the doxology. <laughs> you say, I don't think they appreciate me here either. And so the week continues with my kids, my money, my health, my job, my dreams, my dissatisfaction. I don't know about you, but by the time I get to church on Sunday, I am sick and tired of me. I am ready to hear about a better story than the one that has preoccupied me with myself. I'm ready to hear about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm ready to get caught up in a much better drama that I could possibly choose for myself or self-construct. And so we hear the biblical story every time we gather together as a community. And we're reminded that the very opening words on our lives is not when we were born, it's not when we graduate, it's not when we get married or when we have kids or grandkids or retire. The opening words are, in the beginning, God. There it is. That's how your life story starts. In the beginning, God. That's the most defining parts of your life story. You have a creator, and this creator is not yet done with you. Why would you make a deal with the devil to recreate? That's to be much less than human. You can't be human without having a creator. And as Paul says in Philippians, he who has begun this good creation in you will bring it to completion. God is not done completing your story. There are more dreams, more visions yet to behold. And when you get really scared if you, and lost in the story, just go to the end of the book, like reading a mystery. When you get really terrified, read the end of the story. It, it ends wonderfully. Well, it gets a little scary right before the end. <laughs> but the very end is with this tree of life 
and uh, coming out of the river and that has leaves for the healing of the nations and God making his home among mortals, this is how your story ends. This is what your life is really about, striving for any approximation of that vision that you can during your fleeting years on this earth. That's the goal of your life. And so we're caught up in this far better, exciting story. That's where holy visions come from. And why we'll never take the devil's lousy deal to be realistic when we can live by a vision. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a time for questions and answers. My name is Mark Stryker. I'm uh, Associate Pastor for Christian Formation here at First Press Berkeley. And um, I was sitting here trying to figure out what was the best question to ask you to start this off. And I wrote too many of them. <laughs> so I don't know what to start with. But if you have a question, we'd love to invite you to the mic. You can come forward. But I, I do have one. I, I think that the, the matter you, cho you chose very, I thought, very interesting how you chose the baptism and then the wilderness experience that Jesus temptation and connecting them together. And this may be a, a more of a long answered question, but is for you personally or as a leader in the church, how significant is that belovedness to you? Could you comment on that? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mark. Yeah, it's, uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, and I think it's important to the text to start with the baptism before we get to the temptations. As you obviously know, uh, the gospel wasn't originally written with chapter three, chapter four. I mean, these things just, it's, it's all one story. I think the baptism and the temptations are all intricately related. And our understanding of how we resist the, the temptations is recognizing that the heart of the temptation is doubting our beloved identity. And that's what we convey in our baptism. In our baptism, where we identify with Christ, we're essentially announcing the belovedness as a grace, not as something that's earned. You're not beloved because you got cleaned up. That's why in the Reformed tradition we even baptize babies, uh, because it's all about grace, and who demonstrates that better than a helpless child? Um, and you grow up with faith as a response to grace, not as a precondition to grace. Uh, but we declare the words beloved at the baptismal font, we grow up then with faith, and another synonym of faith would be, I love you too. A question? Yes, could you come up? You will really help us. And anybody else, feel free to come up uh, if you have questions as well. So, we have to duck. <laughs> I, I really appreciated your talk and I have a lot to chew over. Um, I have a question about the point of certainty um, because it seems as if the, the way to stand in these temptations um, is to have a certainty in the identity of beloved. Um, and so I guess my question is, uh, while I agree that there's this element of certainty that is sort of antagonistic to faith, um, there's also a certainty in the promises and faithfulness of God that sort of defines and is a condition for faith. And so, A, I wonder if you agree with that, and B, if you do, what does it look like to cultivate a certainty that is honoring to God and not one that precludes God's working? Yeah, I, I think what I would say is I really want to honor that perspective, and I'd be happy to ponder it and dwell some more on it, but I actually don't agree. Uh, I think precisely in the elements of the relationship uh, to God's promises, that's where certainty is the least helpful and where love is the most helpful, where will is the most helpful, where choices are the most helpful. And again, th these analogies are flawed, but when I think about uh, my loving human relationships that are most important to me with my wife, with my children, uh, none of those are relationships of certainty. They're memories of years and years and years of faithfulness without reasons for doubt but that's different than saying that I'm certain. Uh, and there are times when my wife wants to make it clear that I shouldn't be certain uh, when, I, when I do knucklehead things. 
Uh, but she stays with me because she chooses to, and I choose to believe that she chooses to. Um, but I would say just the opposite, actually, of what you said. I would say the more important it is, the less I want it to be bound to me by certainty, and the more I want it to be bound by love. We can, we can talk later some more if you like. Yeah. Thank you for uh, your insights on the temptations of Christ and, and uh, the significance of them. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, given our location at a major university and the intellectual, rational, secular atmosphere, I'm just wondering if uh, you see uh, any particular connection with any of the temptations uh, from that you know, from that environment. Well, let's stay with the certainty thing. Um, well, I know that there are some academic fields that uh, are built upon certainties. We're living in a, a day and age where um, s certainty and narratives, especially in the humanities, is highly doubted. Um, and even the, the, the postulations of what we call certainty is like your version of certainty, and your, which is different than yours, which is different than mine. Because we have different stories, we can't really have a meta-narrative that holds us all together. So I actually think some of this is actually very conducive to what's going on in universities right now, uh, which in some ways may be more open to this kind of language than they were uh, in earlier days when we were under, I think, some illusions that the, all of society was built upon certain pillars that uh, in the 21st century seem much less certain than they used to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> I think you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, the kind of anthropology you paint is reminding me of, of Niebuhr in the sense of uh, what makes sin possible is part of who we are, but sin is not a part of who we are. Um, but to be, to be fully human, you were talking about, involves this created this way with hunger and a, and a thirst for certainty and to, to hurt. So I, I guess I would ask you to engage from a theodicy perspective and that it is to be human that way, but why did it have to be that way? Or how do we, how do we wrestle with that pain or that, that feeling of incompleteness as being good uh, from a loving God. <laughs> Thank you for an easy one. <laughs> I appreciate that. I love the why questions. Uh, I don't, I mean, I can't do better on theodicy than the theological tradition has uh, before me. Uh, and that wasn't really what I was after tonight, as much as I was anthropology, you're right. I can't, I don't know why, but I know that it is. And I have learned that as a pastor, when I would stay with people's why questions and honor them and even echo them, we would essentially follow the paradigm of Job. We would go on a long journey with why until there was some type of not, um, I, don't, I don't mean this in a, 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 um, a supernatural way, but there was some type of revelation, some type of breakthrough, some type of discovery. Um, and then the, we realized that the why question had led us to who. Who is God? Who am I in the image of God? Who am I as one dependent upon God? All Job's discovery, right, in the whirlwind. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And Job is really satisfied with who to the point where he can walk away from why, which never did get answered. And so I've never been able to find it either, any better than Job did. But I have learned that when people are renewed in who, who God is, who they are, which is some of the stuff that I was getting to tonight in anthropology, they can live in humility without having a good theological answer for why. This question may be somewhat a um, <clears throat> nuance of that, but with regards to certainty, Orthodoxy, um, we think of orthodoxy and doctrine as certainty. And for so many years, even in this tradition, uh, the Reformed tradition, the scriptures preached with certainty, this is the word of God. 
Do you see any theological conclusions that we maybe have come to as a church that has been dangerous for us? That we maybe, we, we want to wrap things up neatly in a bow mm -hmm. uh, in, in so many areas. And, it's, and, and I think sometimes we want to do that to please God, but the, the, Jesus didn't have a terrific relationship with the Pharisees and Sadducees because they seemed to be the certain crowd at all the theological answers. And so this is the certainty thing again. But I wonder how much we do better as a church in terms of evangelism if we weren't know-it-alls. And how do we, how, how might we change that in the training in seminaries? Um, how might we do that differently? Would you comment on that? Sure. Um, I'm not sure that the pursuit of orthodoxy was necessarily a pursuit of certainty. It may be distorted into that. And historically, I think we could find illustrations of that. I don't think we'd find anybody more orthodox than Calvin. Uh, all rise, John Calvin. Um, <laughs> who um, says all knowledge is knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Well, there's not a lot of certainty in that statement. That's, that's faith language. I can't really know myself apart from knowing God in his image I made. We, our ability to know God is by a gift of faith. And so we're back again to the priority of faith over certainty. I think I've had a bit of a nerve on the certainty thing tonight. Um, but it's not the language of faith it's, uh, at all. And it's one of the great temptations, I think, that will make you less than human uh, because humans are by nature people who are bound to each other and bound to God by a choice, which is what faith is, uh, a choice to believe. Uh, and that's what love is. I mean, again, how can you be certain and, 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 and have love? I mean, uh, certainty has no room for love. It's, uh, there's no choice to be made when there's certainty like that. It's necessity. It, it's, it, and love is always an always inevitably a choice. And what you may be getting at is the need for the church to have humility. Uh, and I'm all for that. Uh, but the reason that we don't have humility gets us to the third temptation. That's the deals that we make with the devil. And one of the deals that the church has always been tempted into is uh, power. That you can get what you want if the church is powerful. Uh, and any time the church, uh, right up to today, has aligned itself in houses of power, it has done so at peril to its soul. The church historically is a very good critique of power, but never a good steward of it. Um, and uh, now, you know, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow, so I can say what I want. Uh, but I, I just think. <laughs> you got another five, ten minutes. I just think it's very dangerous uh, when the church. Uh, becomes uh, powerful socially or politically uh, because every time we've seen that historically happen, it's, it's really hurt us. Um, but if we want to talk in terms of our witness, uh, that's always helped when the church is engaged in conversations humbly. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnes. So a lot of what uh, you were talking about in terms of temptation, to me, sounded like uh, a healthy appreciation for a limit. So oftentimes, I think the temptation to be more than human is to exceed our limit. Yes. But we live in a culture and a context that always rewards us for trying to exceed our limit. How do we cultivate a healthy appreciation for living within our limits? All right, yeah. Um, again, I, I wish I had more dramatic answers than things like, well, here it is. Uh, this, is this is why we do exposition of this book. This is why we worship out of this book. We allow, that's why we allow this book to tell our story. 
And at the heart of the faith that we discover out of God's word to us is that life is not an achievement. We have a creator. Life is a grace. And you're right, we live in a society that keeps making us think it's an achievement. Um, I think it was when I was serving the church in D.C. I used to typically give a benediction that says, you're going to decide how you're going to live life this week. And you're either going to think it as something to achieve or something to receive. If you, guys, you remember this when you were there? Something like that. And if you make achievement your goal, your constant companion is going to be complaint because you'll never achieve enough. If you make receiving your life your goal, your constant companion is going to be gratitude because you'll just keep paying attention to all the blessings that you've been given, even while you are limited and, as I said tonight, uh, uh, hurtable and uh, flawed. Uh, if you think of that life as still as something to be received rather than something to be achieved, these are the people who are always grateful. I mean, don't you know people who've had more than their share of hardship in life? And they're like the most delightful people you know. They're just wonderful people. And there are people who have it pretty good and have had a relatively easy life, and you can't stand to be around them for five minutes. Uh, it's not about the circumstances of your life. Uh, it never is. It's about whether you thought of it as something to achieve or something to receive. And the limits thing is tied in with this notion of, of achievement. And we were just taught from the time we were little to push the limits, right? Our coaches pushed us on this. Our, our mentors, our teachers, you do work hard and push the limits, push the limits. And maybe that works on the field, uh, and I get it. I, you know, I understand the advantage of that. But it's bad for your soul, I'll tell you that, uh, to think that you can push the limits. And frankly, most of our worst sins are, happen when we were pushing the limits. Um, uh, in the spirit of the, the, this lecture, say the relationship with the university, seminary, and the church. So university community will be delighted to hear that the, our temptation of certainty make us less than human. But they will try to push you. Seminary is, doesn't go enough. Don't push it to the limit of uncertainty. So university community will say that yes, church and seminary still stay within, a, 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 within some certainty the biblical certainty, the love of God is certain. So what would be your answer to the question from the university side, not from the church side? Yeah. No, I get it. Um, probably not going to publish a lot on this. Um, I think what, what people are looking for when they say certainty, uh, I would rather refer to as reliability. Uh, there are things that, are re that I can rely on, not because I'm certain of them, but because I have faith in them. Uh, and there's just enough, I think uh, there's enough expansion on the frontiers of our knowledge of the things that in the 20th century we called certain pillars of modernity that have crumbled on us. It doesn't mean that the whole thing has fallen apart. It doesn't mean we live with complete uncertainty or with anarchy or with anomie. Uh, of course not. We have a certain reliability. Uh, and I, when I go over a bridge, I, I think it's, I trust that the engineers who built it, uh, and it's going to be reliable, it's going to hold me up. But there have been enough bridges that have fallen down, so I wouldn't say it's certain, but it's reliable. Uh, there's a good normative history here of reliability. And coming to our relationship with God, which is the thing where I'm trying to get to, I'm not saying that all of life is, is based on uncertainty, uh, I'm not that much of a postmodernist. Um, but I am saying the most important things are things that we are bound to by love and faith. And I'll even give you reliability. Um, but once you strive for certainty, you starve love. Because again, love is a, is a choice. It's not a necessity. Um, let me close with an illustration of this point. When I was a seminary student, 
We had this great New Testament professor named uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger. Classic professor, white hair, three-piece suit, wire rim glasses, even had a little pocket watch thing going. Uh, and he would read his lectures. And one day he was reading his lecture and he stopped and he looked up at us and he said, um, young women and men, I hope that when you begin your ministries, you'll start each morning by getting on your knees and thanking God that you're not necessary. And he went back to his lecture. <laughs> and so again, it was in my notes and I'm thinking, you are not necessary. It kind of stuck there and it, and it bugged me and I didn't know what to make of it. But this was Dr. Metzger, he was like fourth member of the Trinity in those days. So I, <laughs> I wasn't gonna take him on. So I left seminary, I began my ministry uh, and I, this thing kept gnawing at me. Thank God that you're not necessary. I could, oh, don't we need more people? Like the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Don't we need more? And didn't I become you know, here because God needed me to help, and, which by the way is heresy. Um, and so we had our five-year reunion that I went to and, uh, at the seminary as an alumni, a relatively new alumni, and I found Dr. Metzger walking across the quad, and I just couldn't stand anymore. I had to go talk to him about this. So I ran up to him and I said, Dr. Metzger, in one of your lectures, you had this little aside. You said that we were supposed to get on our knees every morning and thank God that we're unnecessary. And I was just wondering, oh, do, you, do you want to take that back? Uh, <laughs> and, and he said, no, no, Craig, you're not necessary. Almost as if to say, especially you, Craig. <laughs> or, really, we could get by. But then he gave me the second sentence that I wish he'd given us five years ago. He says, you're too important to be necessary. Because you're beloved. And we can't love things that are necessary. When it's necessary, you have no choice. So it wasn't necessary for God to become incarnate in Christ. It wasn't necessary for him to find us in the futility of getting our lives cleaned up in baptism. It wasn't, none of that was necessary. It was done by holy choice, which we call grace. So why would you settle for things that are necessary or certain or when you could have love? And I think when it comes to anthropology, uh, which I've been after what talking about tonight, when it comes to the human condition, anytime we strive for something like necessity or certainty, we become less than human. Humans live out of their souls, and those are kept alive by the gracious love of God. Thank you again. Um, before we uh, finish with a couple more of us from the committee with some words tonight, uh, Dr. Barnes, thank you. Uh, we on the committee are very thankful and grateful for you being with us. And Marianne White, who is on our committee, has put together this uh, plaque with a frame that she personally did to give you as the first annual um, lecture at, uh, for, for uh, the Earl Palmer Lecture Series. And we'd love you to have this. Oh, how beautiful. Barry Koops is going to come and talk about just a couple words about development on the lecture series. I've been honored to serve with this committee planning this lectureship. This is something, this initiative, that's really dear to my heart. And this afternoon, some of us heard uh, Earl Palmer talk about lecture series decades ago already, back in the 70s and 80s, and it's really precious to me to see that that tradition is being revived here and that we could start with this lecture this evening. Has there ever been a better time for this kind of lecture and lectureship in our community for people at GTU, at New College, at, at the university, 
and for folks like us at First Press and at other churches. Has there ever been a time when we need more dearly than we do now that wisdom, inspiration, and vision? Several of us, several of you, have already made contributions to to, uh, support this and, and to endow it for the future, and thank you very much. The, for the committee, I'm here to invite financial support from everybody else. We're asking friends for contributions to cover the first lecture, and we're inviting all of you to consider significant contributions that will create an endowment to ensure the future of lectures like this for next year, next decade, perhaps longer, the Lord willing. If you have been considering a gift toward the lectureship, this weekend would be a good time to step forward. And here are two ways to to contribute. First, New College, New College Berkeley, has agreed to be the conduit and the fund holder for the lectureship. And so, to make your contribution, you can go to the New College website and make an online contribution. And believe me, the instructions there are very clear and it will be very easy. For those of you who who like to write checks, you can write a check payable to New College Berkeley with the designation for Berkeley Palmer Lectureship. And of course, you can speak to me or Susan or Mark or Ryan or one of the other members of the committee in a few minutes. Friends, I urge you to decide the level of your contribution and to make that gift this weekend. Do it before the voice that you've just heard has faded before that wisdom and inspiration and vision has dissipated, has been sort of blurred by the busyness of Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Decide and act now. Friends, there won't be a better time. Shalom. (laughs) Jeff Berry, Um, board member from New College will give the closing prayer. Thank you, Barry. Um, Before I uh, close in prayer, there will be a reception in the uh, Calvin room just past uh, that way out in the courtyard, and we'd love to have all you join us there for some fellowship and discussion uh, right after uh, we close this evening. Uh, Bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Father, we remember that you are God and that you are our God and that we worship you. You have showered blessings on us tonight. You have brought us Earl and Shirley. Thank you for that. And for their work in creating this Berkeley Palmer Lectureship Series that the inauguration is tonight. The blessings tonight of this unique partnership, this collaboration between the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley and New College of Berkeley is, is unique, and we thank you for that. You've also blessed us with Craig. He brought him here tonight to us from far away, and he gave us many encouraging words of parts of Matthew that we hadn't really perhaps considered before, and we pray that you use these encouraging words in our heart that we go forward to help shape us and transform us in the days and the weeks uh, going forward. Father, help us to remember, help us to know that we are your beloved, the beloved, and that you are pleased, and that we have assurances in that. And that's not certainty, that's faith. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.